Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to this course on advanced data visualization. We'll be talking about a variety of different topics around data viz, a bit more theory, and how to use different kinds of data, data visualizations and different kinds of charts. I'm Robert Kosara. I'm a, a data viz uh, developer here at uh, Observable, and I will be walking you through uh, all of these examples over the next uh, few weeks. So this will be uh, five sessions over the next two or th two and a half weeks. Uh, and with that, I'm already kind of jumping into my first, the first part I want to do here, but I just wanted to say uh, hi to everybody who's tuning in from all over the world. So I'm seeing people from India, fo folks from Europe, folks very close to here. So I'm in Seattle and I see somebody from Vancouver Island. So that's <laughs> sunshine, happy place. <laughs> I like that. Um, and of course, folks from uh, the, certainly the, the two coasts in the US, people from California, people from the East Coast, and all over the place. So, so welcome everybody. Very excited to have you all here. And I will switch over to my different view here. We'll see how this works. There we go. Uh, and uh, so this is the Advanced Data Visualization course. We call this Techniques, Interaction, and Data Patterns. And all of this will hopefully make <clears throat> more sense as we go along. Uh, a few preliminaries here uh, about how we're going to do this course. So uh, as I said, we have these five sessions that are going to be uh, every Tuesday and Thursday for the next couple of weeks. And then um, in the, and, and so we have these live, of course, and, and, and of course the folks who are watching live now will realize that you can ask questions and comment in the comments here on YouTube. Uh, or wherever you're watching. I think you can also watch on LinkedIn and we'll do our best to uh, respond to those. And usually what I do is I try to keep an eye on comments and then and then come back and like respond to things as they come up. But I will try to, uh, so, oh, okay, I see we're only doing YouTube this time. Sorry <laughs> about that. Uh, and also, uh, I should also mention I have my colleagues here, Wayne uh, Sutter and Sutton and uh, Paul Buffer, who are managing the comments, uh, who will be flagging them for me to respond to. So if you have any questions, short version of this is if you have questions, please feel free to ask. Don't wait to ask, just ask as you have a question and we'll come back to the question if there is any kind of reasonable answer <laughs> that I can give you. So here's a quick uh, overview of uh, how this is going to work. We have a little, this is a little overview document that, and I should actually have copied this link here, but the, but we'll post it in the, uh, uh, on the uh, chat and also on the, uh, uh, in, in Slack. This is just to briefly walk through, and this is also, I should say, so this is of course unobservable. We have a little collection here and this will have all of the materials popping up over time for the different lessons. So today there will be one after we're done here because I'm gonna be using a bunch of slides today and still need to figure out how to share those, but there will be notebooks here. Uh, so this is how you navigate that on the side. And then um, I will, and then, and then uh, this has some of the preliminaries here and then we'll have uh, more of the content uh, in these notebooks as well. And since I just see this question here about the requirements, I will get to that in a second. So just very briefly, so the structure here is we have these five lectures, they're one uh, each hour, uh, one hour each, <laughs> that's how this works. Uh, the idea is to have about 45 minutes of content and about 15 minutes for questions, but the idea, uh, this will be interleaved. So I'm not gonna wait until the end. And each has kind of a theme. So today is a bit of a mixed bag. It's about grammar of graphics and a bit of theory, but the others have more of a, a more of a cohesive theme. And then we'll talk about one kind of uh, data viz or more uncommon data viz technique a bit more in depth at the end. And uh, I will, as I said, I will share the notebook usually before the class, but today, because I didn't realize I couldn't actually share these slides, I will do that um, uh, Later afterwards. And then at the end, we'll have an assignment uh, to get, uh, so you can get a certificate. So that's that's the uh, the plan. Yeah, you already know how to ask questions. We have a link here to the, the community Slack. Oh, I'm actually scrolling this off the top here, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, so that, so well, you, you can go there if, you, if you're not part of this already, because on the Slack, you can ask questions, you can, uh, you can, uh, discuss what we talk about in this course. And then as for prerequisites, we have um, 
the uh, sorry, my, my screen capture is a little bit cut off there at the top, but I hope this works. Um, there, there was a previous course, the Database Visualization Fundamentals and Best Practices, that I would encourage you to look through uh, because I'm kind of assuming that you know the basics of database here. And then, uh, yeah, as, as we just posted here on the chat, the, the only uh, requirement really is that you have an observable account and that you make yourself familiar with observable. And there are a few links here uh, for how to do this that I, I won't go through, but I, and I will uh, be doing more observable in the next, uh, in the next few uh, lessons, not not uh, so much today because today will be more theory. So I'm going to do slides for that. And then just a few words about myself. I, I figure most of people who have signed up probably have some kind of sense of who I am. But uh, so I'm Robert Kosara. I've been in database research for many years now, and uh, I've done work uh, on. Uh, a number of different topics ranging from database techniques. I'm actually going to show you one that I worked on uh, today as one of the examples and work on how to tell stories with data, how to communicate with data, how people work with data in settings that are like group settings. So collaboration with data is, is another topic that I'm interested in and the perception of data, of course, uh, as well. And then I will very briefly just talk about this last part here recommended books so i have three links here and these are the same as the fundamentals course if you remember that this is actually the same list here and the uh and so this is the uh, the, the the first one here is is so so the reason i'm, I'm have this i have a short list and i will actually talk about the different book today the grammar of graphics and i will tell you why you shouldn't actually read that <laughs> unless you want to but i would actually start with these books on this list so the first one here is by andy kirk data visualization a handbook for data driven design uh the second one is colonos barman Affleck, storytelling with data uh, and then the last one is john schwabish better data visualizations all three of these i think are really good overviews of data visualization they cover a lot of ground and the, what I usually tell people is to, to pick one and read that and not buy three books and then don't read them because the problem with too many books and usually I have my bookshelf behind me, but I just moved. So it's all still in boxes, but I have tons of books, but I can tell you that having more books doesn't mean you actually read more of them. So it's better to have fewer and read those <laughs> than to have tons and not read them. So that's my recommendation here. That's why I, also why this is a, um, a uh, short list here. So there's no, since there's just a question here about the notebook, there's no notebook for this right now and not today. There will be for the next few, but not today because I will be talking a bit about theory. So that is um, where we're gonna go right now if I can rearrange my view here. So I want to talk a little bit about sort of the, the background of data visualization and some of the ideas behind what I'm trying to do with this particular course. And that revolves around this question of why do we even visualize data? And this may be kind of self-evident that, that people say, well, of course you create data visualizations, but I think it's too easy to just like do something that is a data viz that, that creates a chart that isn't without really thinking about what is the point of doing that. And so the, the, something that really kind of crystallizes this into a very kind of succinct point, I think, is that uh, this quote here from the readings, information in, the readings in Information Visualization by Stu Card, Chuck McKinley, and Ben Schneiderman, where they took uh, an, an, a quote from, I think this was John Hamming who, who wrote this in like the 40s, who was talking about computing. He was saying the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. And so they took this and they turned it into this sort of visualization specific uh, way of thinking about uh, what we're doing. And so they're saying the purpose of visualization is insight, not pictures. And I think this is a very neat, very succinct way of, of really thinking about, well, what is, what are you trying to accomplish? What are you trying to do that is the, uh, that you're actually doing with this, with this chart or with this, with this dashboard perhaps? So uh, in so that's what I'm trying to, to do here is to say, well, think about why you're doing this, why you're making this chart. And very often, and I will talk about this a little bit, not today, but um, probably actually on Thursday, that 
you could argue whether tables are a data visualization or not, but I think often what people actually need are more tables, not even necessarily more charts. I'm not saying this because you know it's like I'm trying to like talk down data viz because obviously data viz is awesome, but what I'm trying to say is that we have to think harder about what we're doing uh, if you really want to do something that is of value to people. And there's a little illustration that I like for this, even though it's not exactly speaking to this exact point, but this is from, I think, a comic about how to uh, think about art. I actually found this in a book that is called What is Painting by Julian Bell, a very good book uh, if anybody's interested in like artsy things and like the thinking behind art. Uh, I'm not sure how you can how well you can read this, but because this is kind of from a very small comic, but so this guy is standing there like pointing at this picture and saying, haha, what does this represent? And then the, the picture goes like, well, what do you represent? And I, I think about this a lot because data visualization, of course, is the representation of data. And we have to ask this question, well, what does this represent? And what are we trying to do with this? What is uh, a chart actually good for? And, and so that's where I think we need, to, we need to ask these questions a bit more. And this is, again, this is obviously not exactly about data viz, but I think it's, it's kind of a nice uh, reminder of, of uh, the fact that we need to do this. All right, so let's get to actual charts. So uh, I do want to talk about the the kinds of, of things that, that we'll talk about in this course, which will be some of the more unusual and more advanced data visualization techniques, like parallel coordinates and things like that, and uh, and about the, the thinking behind them a little bit. And this is going to be kind of high level. And so what I'm going to do is just to give you a bit more of a sense of what the plan is for today. So I will talk about this a little bit, and then I will talk about, and then show you a few, a few examples, and then I will talk about the grammar of graphics, what that is, and why we care, <laughs> and and then at the end I'll talk about scatter plots, scatter plot matrices, and sort of a faceted scatter plot. That's that's the plan for for today. And I haven't talked through the whole thing because I think you've all seen the list of topics that are in this course. So I don't think I need to do that. Um, all right, so common charts, uh, you know, those are things that everybody is familiar with, line charts, bar charts, I guess we could argue about scatter plots, pie charts, things like that. So there are lots of charts, of course, that are, uh, that are common that people use all the time. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. In fact, it's actually really uh, very helpful to have those because they, they are familiar, people understand them, or at least people know them. I would say that, or they, they recognize them, let's put it this way. So they, they, they will see a bar chart, they will see a line chart, they will not be intimidated by that. So that, that's a good thing, and they will hopefully also understand how to read that. Now, of course, there is there are some nuances to that, because people will be more familiar with how to actually read a chart, even a simple chart, that can be a difference between different audiences, different, different people, even. And then... The people who are so there's sort of like the the expertise on the on the vis side, and then there's the, the expertise on the data side. So people who are familiar with the data set that they're looking at, or with the kind of the data as it has progressed over time, will have a much better chance of understanding what you're showing them. And that's another thing we'll talk about at some point. I think next week on Tuesday, I believe, uh, which will be about audience to think about what who is your audience, what do they know, what do they expect, what do they want. And 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 you know working towards that uh, a bit more. Of course, simple or like common charts. I shouldn't call them simple. Uh, are uh, easy to make in a variety of different tools. I'm using a Google Slides here. I could just drop a chart into the slide because it's just built into a lot of like slides tools now. But well, we'll get to that. But of course, these are all the common charts because that's what you know. These are the ones that are commonly used. So that's why those are available. Uh, and you only get a small set uh, of those, usually when you do this in something like PowerPoint or Google Slides or Keynote or things like that. And they also work across many different data sets. So there's something about being the simple charts, bar charts, especially bar charts and line charts, probably the most common ones. They're sort of the workhorses of data viz. They just work for a lot of different data sets. And they're not usually sensitive to the content. And I, this might not make a ton of sense, but I will talk about this more when we get, certainly when we get to the connected scatter plot, which is a very, very difficult technique that very often doesn't work. Not so much because it doesn't fit the data or the data shape, the data uh, types, 
but because it just doesn't work when you apply it to a certain data set. And there's a bit more to it that, than that, that I will talk about a little bit as well when we talk about data, because there is, there's more, uh, there's more dependency on the actual data set than we often like to admit. So very, very often data viz basically talks about the data types. You have a continuous and a categorical axis, so that means you need a bar chart and things like that. But it, but there is actually more to it than than that because it does depend on what the data actually contains, whether certain techniques work or not. Uh, and and I'll show you some examples, not necessarily today, but I will get more into that because I think it's an important topic that often is overlooked, and I think needs to be thought about a little bit more. Of course, common chart types also have some cons. Uh, one being that they are boring and forgettable. And I mean this uh, quite literally because when you have a presentation and you're showing people 15 different bar charts or 100 different bar charts, and that is actually not uncommon, people just won't be able to remember which one was which, right? Because they all look the same. So it's, it can be really difficult for people to, first of all, to stay focused because they're just looking at the same kind of chart over and over again. And, and then just, just re retain what you showed them. So if it's all the same chart type, it's just gonna get much more difficult to, for people to, to remember what you showed them. So especially in a presentation context where you're trying to get something across, where you're trying to get people to make a decision to, 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 to take something away, uh, something like that, it's, it's often helpful to take people out of, of, the, kind of the, 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 the usual thinking and, and just do something unusual. And I've, I may, I'll, I'll talk about this a bit more in depth when we talk about audience, but I've done some work where we interviewed people who do data work in groups and presentations. And we heard this from a good number of people who just wanted to use more unusual charts just because they knew that people are just zoning out, especially in this sort of remote situation where you can, you can see people are just like doing stuff on their phones or whatever, because you can see them kind of look off the screen or off the camera. And because they're getting bored. So it, it can be helpful to, to make things a bit more interesting, to kind of spice things up a little bit by, by using more unusual charts. These charts also are not specific to the data or the task. And uh, the task, certainly, I think people understand, like, what is the kind of question that, that you're asking or what is the kind of context that you have? And I will show a few examples as we kind of go through this course where the where a specific chart can be a much better representation, even though you could do just a simple, like, or a common chart. I keep saying simple, but I mean a common chart. Uncommon charts can be very simple too. <laughs> but um, anyway, and then the data, again, can make things more, uh, more uh, trickier, basically, for specific chart types. And so then it can be a good thing to think about that as well. Oh yeah, and then of course the last, my last point here is a bit more of a, a, a gotcha, is that <laughs> it's easy to make them, but that might not be the right way uh, to show the data. And so I'll get to this uh, again. I'm thinking about the the section on time because I have a specific thing in, in mind there. But uh, let me just kind of hand wave very briefly about how this what I'm thinking about here. When we when we show data over time, very often we use line charts. And when, we, when you create a line chart in most software, it will assume that the axis, the time axis is continuous. Well, it is continuous, right? But when you have data that actually jumps between values at distinct points, you will get linear lines, or like, uh, not linear lines, <laughs> you will get straight lines connecting those points, even though what you actually want to show is that there are, there are discrete jumps. And so it's, it's easy to just get that wrong because you are, you're, you're just taking essentially what the, what the tool gives you, but the tool doesn't know what you're trying to accomplish. So it, this isn't necessarily about uncommon chart types, but it's about sort of like making sure that you're, you're telling your tool exactly what you want it to do, your tool or library, whatever it is that you're using. And so the, I will, I will show you the example uh, in a bit. I'm not sure I can show you this right now, but um, but but we'll get to this. So so making making these charts is easy. So, so basically, this is the, the the cons side of the of the pro that it's easy to make these charts because it can be a bit of a pitfall and you can miss things just because you can make bar charts for everything doesn't mean that the bar chart is actually the right representation. And again, this is nothing against. Uh, 
without against uh, talking about the uh, uh, you know using these charts, but just a uh, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at the comments here, so I'm kind of losing my thread. But so this is not, not about uh, that, that that there's anything wrong with these common charts. They're, again, they're super useful and they're common for a reason. But I think it's helpful to keep in mind why why we have other things as well. All right, I should probably move along here because. Uh, talking a bit too much about these things. So then the uncommon charts, this is sort of like the flip side of the whole thing. So flip uncommon charts, I will show you a few of those in a moment, but things like Sankey diagrams, connected scatter plots, power diagrams. Power diagrams are, are like tree maps, but uh, with unusual shapes. Uh, and I'll talk about those briefly when we talk about tree maps. Um, I think this might actually be on Thursday, I'm not sure. No, it's not Thursday, it's next week. Um, but uh, anyway, but there are, uh, a number of charts, of course, that are unusual that people that that uh, people that that take this course presumably have seen before, or at least have heard before, uh, heard of before, uh, and there are lots more. And so, pros here are that they can be more specific to the data or the task than the common charts because they are uncommon and so like more bespoke, and they are more attention attention catching and memorable because they are unusual again so you can make things that are a bit more advanced that are a bit more unusual and those will stand out because they are atypical and i'll show you some examples in a moment just to kind of give you a few examples but but uh, i think you you all are have seen some of those before certainly and so this is the point that i was kind of dwelling a, a bit too much earlier <laughs> about making it too easy to make simple charts that might not be the right choice is that when you're thinking about what what uncommon thing to do or what what specific thing to to perhaps design for this kind of of data you have to think harder about what you're actually looking at and that can be a very helpful thing to do very i mean a lot of people don't have the sort of luxury or the time to do that but when you see things that are really interesting representations that people at the new york times perhaps do that people that like um uh I'm trying to think of a name right now and I can't, but we've all seen these great, like very specific kind of artistic visualizations that can be very interesting because if they're really, if somebody really spent time with a data set and tried to figure out what is this, not just what is the data type, but also what, how do I represent this data in a way that is specific to this kind of thing, to this topic. And that can be a really interesting thing to do. And it can also lead you to insights that you wouldn't have got, gotten otherwise. Of course there are cons, uh, one big con is always that if you're using this to represent data to somebody to help people understand some data, you will perhaps have to explain how to read this. And they might not want to learn a new chart type, or they might just be scared of, of a different representation than what they used to. Uh, and, and they might not be able to understand what you're telling them, especially if you're not the, there to kind of lead them through that. And so that, that I think is, is certainly a con and can be uh, dangerous. So it, it's always an important, like, balancing act here is between doing things that are unusual and things that are, you know, a bit more, uh, and, and things that are more common. They're usually more, more difficult to make. Uh, and this, the, the, the goalpost, of course, is kind of moving here. So things more, more un, sort of unusual chart types get added to a lot of tools, of course, over time, but uh, it can need, you, can, you might need specialized tools. You might have to go uh, to something that, that you haven't used before to do these. Uh, and then they, they might be very specific to the data, to the topic of the data, or to the specific data set even. And, and again, I'll show you an example of this uh, a little later um, uh, to, to kind of illustrate this point. I'm just looking through the, the comments here real quick. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think the, uh, okay, very briefly, I'll, I'll show a few here. So this is a really interesting point. In my last role, I was asked to mock up charts without the actual data. That's really interesting. That's a great exercise. Uh, it's really easy to just sort of like throw the data into your into your program and just have it make a chart. But this is a really interesting data set uh, exercise. It's also interesting to think about what you don't have because it's often too easy. And I'll talk about this a little bit when I talk about data, uh, is that to, to look at like, oh, this is the data, this is all there is. But there's often something you don't have, and that can be even more important at times than, than what you have in your data. Um, yeah, this is an interesting point too. So uh, I recall a time when my manager really wanted an infographic, but it was forced. And the most insightful tool for telling the story was actually just a narrative. And so, yeah, exactly. Sometimes, it, and sometimes it can be a single number, like very, 
I shouldn't see very often, but sometimes <laughs> all you need to know is a single little number and maybe some context to it, or really a very simple chart. So it can be it can be very it can be very easy to overcomplicate things to have lots and lots of charts to show. Again, I'll talk about this when I talk about audience, <laughs> because a lot of people like to say, "Well, look at all this work I've done," but uh, it can be quite uh, helpful to just and it actually is very often the more uh, the harder thing to reduce things and really go only to the things that that really uh, that really make the point that you're trying to make. And like me, because I'm kind of talking a bit too much here. But let's go to <laughs> some examples. If we can switch here. Okay. So here are a few examples that I wanted to show of unusual data types. And this is just simply to walk you through a few of them. And we'll come back to not all of these, but many of these as we go along. So here's the connected scatter plot. If you haven't seen this before, the idea is that we have two axes here. This is about the the uh, cost of gas or, or the cost of oil, I guess. Uh, no, this is gas over time. So this is uh, the the cost of, of gas per gallon in the US in dollars on the vertical axis and the number of miles people drive per year. Uh, and so this is a per, per person. So this is normalized by uh, population. So this is by population growth. And you can actually, we can play this. I don't think that the animation is all that helpful, except it shows you one thing about this chart, which is that the the, the time axis goes along this line. And we'll talk about this more in depth later, so I don't want to talk about this too much, but this is an interesting technique that can work extremely well, but very often does not work at all because you just end up with a hairball. And so this is one of those examples of an unusual chart type that's really interesting, that's great for, for presenting data and for making getting people interested and, and wanting to explore the data, but it's very specific to the data set especially. Um, then here, oh, okay, so parallel sets is next. I was actually, <laughs> but so this is actually a technique that I have worked on or that I developed with uh, colleagues, Fabian Bendix and Helvig Hauser. Uh, that is essentially, that's a bit like a Sankey diagram, which I thought I was going to show first. But the, the idea here is that we have categories. So this is a data set about the Titanic. Uh, this is the number of people. Each of these here is a different uh, category. And uh, what you see here is basically the number of people who perished uh, and who survived. So this is basically these two lines represent the, the fraction, how many people died, how many survived, then how many were male or female, how this splits up here. So you can see how this is broken up by for survivors and uh, people who didn't make it, then adults and children, and then the different classes. And you can also rearrange these so you can get different views of the axes. And we didn't think about it this way, but uh, it's actually kind of similar. It's certainly quite, it looks very similar to a Sankey diagram. So uh, sorry, this is a little bit off. So the Sankey diagram is certainly the older one. And this is more of a flow. So the idea with the Sankey is that it shows you the uh, uh, any kind of flow of things. It's often used for like money flows or for power or for like electricity, things like that. So this one is about, I think this is about electricity generation. So it, there are different like sources that go through different kind of stages here and then uh, are used in different uh, in different kinds of, oh, I'm actually cutting this off a lot with my face here, <laughs> but they are used uh, or they, they go into different places here. So they're used in industry, they're used in homes and so on. And then there's a whole bunch of losses, of course, because when you do the thermal generation, you end up with a lot of the energy actually going to waste. And you can see that and you can make this kind of more complex kind of structure where you can have all kinds of things going on that are that that go along the sort of like graph structure this is this is the difference from parallel sets parallel sets is actually very much a categorical uh data set this is a tabular data set that we start out with here this one is a flow that's much more like a graph we'll talk about well we'll talk about the sankey diagram uh, i think at some point i'm not sure if i have if i changed it or not the tree map is one that i think has gotten much more common sort of sort of recently which is more like uh, in the last 10 ish years, I would say, that uh, breaks down a, an area into smaller areas. So the idea is that the area of each of these rectangles here represents the f a fraction. So this could be, or a part of the whole. So the whole, which I can't even show you entirely because it's a bit too big for this, <laughs> for this screen. But the, the total thing here, this is about, this is actually just a, a, an example here from the, um, I think this is the 
there. This is a, a D3 example, so I'm not sure this might be the D3 code actually, but um, I think it is. Uh, and then how this breaks down into different large groups. These are the ones that are colored. So these are different uh, different colors. Here are the different kinds of uh, like larger groups, and then it breaks that down further into smaller ones. So everything that's kind of in this gray at the top is in this viz. Uh, category and that breaks down into smaller subsections and then even smaller ones. And then there are different ones that have colors here, like the query uh, down here that has like different subsections in there. And so that you see how much code there is in each of those subsections as a part of the total thing. And, and tree maps are kind of interesting because they, they were meant to be, oh, it's actually Flare, sorry, it's not actually D3. This is the Flare data set from many, many years ago because Flare was a data visualization library for Flash. Uh, if anybody remembers that, so the way tree maps do this is that they uh, they, they are really they are supposed to be uh, hierarchical. So we have a hierarchy of several steps in this case. I think this is three steps down, but uh, many people actually use them like a pie chart today, and we'll talk about this a little bit uh, when we get to tree maps. Um, and they have their pros and cons. And then the scatterplot matrix. I think this is my last example. This one is uh, the more the more complex type of a scatter plot. So I call the scatter plot a common chart in my on my slide. And one could argue whether that's a, true or not, but it's it's certainly becoming more known, I think, and it's been used. And so I'm, I'm using the New York Times here <laughs> as my uh, as my reference because they've been using scatter plots certainly with annotations, but they've been using them for a while now. And they seem to work for some data, at least. This example, this is also the three example. Uh, it actually, I think this is the brushable. Yeah, this is the brushable one. So this has a data set that we'll look at in the moment. Well, a little bit later, once I've talked about the grammar of graphics, I hope I can actually get to this, where we have different, in each row and each column, we have a different data dimension. Actually, I might try to zoom out here and see if I can fit this whole thing onto the screen at once, pretty much. I'm just gonna hide the legend there. So this is a data set about penguins, and we'll talk about this in a little bit when, when I show you the example at the end. But they have different body me measurements here. The the common length, the common is like the, the beak of the of the penguin. And then there are two here, the common length and the common depth, and then there's the flipper length and their body mass, so how, how much they weigh. And each row and each column is one of these dimensions. Actually, I'm going to not, not going to go into that much detail here because I'm going to talk about it again at the end. But the way this works here is essentially that you have a matrix of data dimensions. So the, the, the column is the same data dimension down. So column length is, in this, is the x-axis in this first column. And it's also the y-axis in this row, which is why you see this diagonal here because in the top or along the diagonal, we always plot the same dimension of data, the same column in the data set against, against itself. So this is the, the column length on the vertical axis in, in this row, in the first row, and on the horizontal axis in the first column. And so then the common depth is in the second one. And so up here we have common depth on the x-axis and common length on the y-axis. And so you get all the combinations that you could do with these uh, with these, um, with these, with the whole set of, of of data dimensions here, and yes, this is brushable. Somebody just mentioned that, so we'll talk about brushing in inter in the interaction part. But just very briefly, this is this is of course the neat part of this. So I could just say, well, let's let's grab some part of this. So, so I did this because we. So these are different species here that have different colors, and so I could say, well, let's grab, and I can just like drag over here and just highlight this part here, which is blue. And I can see that that actually highlights blue in all the other ones. So this is interesting because this tells me that there that there is a very very well separated cluster here in terms of the data. And if I go somewhere here into this region, which is uh, the orange, uh, the, the chin strap, we see we see that there's more overlap with the green ones, the Chen two, and then the Chen two here uh, have some more overlap with the. Uh, orange ones. I would have to resize this, but anyway. So you can see, and of course, it's just fun to play with this and kind of explore this data that way. But so brushing, we'll get to. I'm I'm already kind of spending a bit more time than I wanted on all of these examples. All right. So oh, and then one more example, just very briefly. Atypical chart types. This is a uh, a chart that I think. Oh no, it's actually not Mike Boss, but Mike Boss uses this as an example in. Um, 
in D3 and in the plot too, this is a, a chart uh, about inequality in American cities between two years. So the first point here is 1980, and the second one is 2015. And then uh, in, uh, and he actually has an example, I'll just very briefly show you this because I think it's a good example. So there is an animated version of this, and the animated version is kind of cooler because it's animated, right? It's kind of, it's more fun perhaps, but there is always the problem that uh, you can't actually follow the, the, the points as well. You can see which one has the biggest differences and which way the points actually moved. And so having these little arrows helps you do that. So this is a very specific thing that you're not gonna do very often, but when it works, like in this case, it really does work. And so this is really great. Um, all right. Oh, and then my last example, but now for sure, <laughs> this is going to be the last one. This is called a ridgeline plot. I'll, I'll talk about this when we talk about time again. But this is basically an area chart, and we'll talk about facets a little bit later. So you can have facets of, of, of data where you break down this, this. This is a time use data where it's about like, what do people do in the course of a day? Or like, when do people do certain things? And you could make a long list of these charts and show them all on a, on a common axis but you would end up with something that's extremely tall because you have a lot of categories here. And so what the Ridgeline plot, or it's called also, also called a Choi plot, does is it sort of like overlays them. So you're gonna lose some, some of the data because it will be hidden behind some of the other data. But for the most part, you can kind of live with that and you can just say, well, I can see most of the, of the data. I can see where it's sort of like the overall patterns. And so this way I can see like there's, I don't know, Aerobics is things people do in the morning and at night. This is this dark one here. Whereas walking, walking is something that's much more common along like the whole day, essentially. Uh, and there are a few others that have like these, like, or like martial arts is something people do at night. They don't do this a whole lot in the morning and so on. So you can see things here that are harder uh, to, to see when you have just a huge list because you can't compare things as easily. But of course, there's a trade-off here. You're going to not see other things uh, at the same time. All right. So yeah, this is all of course inobservable, and we'll and so today I'm not using a lot of I'm gonna do a little bit of observable at the end, but uh, I'm mostly just showing you examples uh, of of things that are that that we're that are living in in observable notebooks here. Um, all right, so actually no, I want to switch back here. Yes, and so there's just a, a comment here about. Um, brushing in observable plot. So you can, of course, brush in D3. So what I just showed you also is um, that example earlier. Here, this is also inobservable, but it's using D3. Uh, but, and so actually I will talk about this in a moment because interaction is, is more difficult to do when you have a grammar-based approach that is, um, uh, than, than when you have a programmatic approach. Let me just again, the comments. All right. So, so I want to talk a, bit, a little bit about grammar of graphics because the that was a, a, something that came up a few times in the fundamentals course, and people were asking about it. And so I thought I wanted to. So and and I want to talk a bit about plot, observable plot, which is a grammar based uh, library system, and a bit about like what that means and why this would be a good thing or not. Um, and I will try to be a bit more efficient because I'm running a little bit behind right now on <laughs> my plan. So there, I'm calling this the grammar of graphics and grammars of graphics, and I hope this will be clear in a moment why. So there is the grammar of graphics. This is a book that was written and published by Lee Wilkinson, Lee Lynn Wilkinson, Wilkinson in, first in 2000 and then 2004. I think the, the one that everybody knows, who knows the grammar of graphics is pretty much the second edition. So uh, it's essentially 2004 is the really important one. And uh, Wilkinson came up with this structured layered grammar of graphics to build charts. And Wilkinson was a statistician. He passed away a few years ago. Uh, and he came at, and, and in statistics, and I don't know if everybody's necessarily familiar with this, statistical graphics go back, well, they certainly go back many hundreds of years, but statistical graphics as a serious tool for doing statistics go back to about the 70s, I think, uh, Chan Tuki and then, and then other folks doing a lot of data analysis using charts, using scatter plots, using uh, all, all, and fairly specialized charts too sometimes, but also common ones, especially like scatter plots. 
And what Wilkinson was after was to, instead of having every single chart be sort of uh, ad hoc, he was trying to come up with a way to make them more consistent and, and, and make them be part of a bigger picture of how charts work. And so that was that was that was really the, the, the thinking behind this gra grammar. So there are these common and, and the reason why it's called a grammar is because there are these common building blocks and then there are these composition operators that are like a grammar that are well that follow a grammar that can that can then make new things and more complex things, new things out of these building blocks. Yeah, and as opposed to ad hoc building of specific charts. So it's not like a bar chart and a scatter plot are just entirely different things. They have things in common. And that is important to realize. And that means you can, you can, you also, it makes it easier to build systems because when you, when you think about a grammar, because you can build those building blocks and then compose them rather than have entirely separate code for every single thing that you're building. Uh, and yeah, very much focused on statistical graphics, of course, because that's where Wilkinson was coming from. But, but also, when you read the, the grammar of graphics, there's a lot of statistics in there. So uh, I found this quite both interesting and sort of like uh, difficult to kind of get to the, the, the graphical side <laughs> of things, because Wilkinson isn't just interested in the charts. He wanted to, to make this part of a whole data analysis uh, sort of process. And yeah, and so also this this builds upon Jacques Bertin's Semiology of Graphics, which was a book that that was published in the '60s. I forget the actual year, '63, I believe, uh, and then was kind of forgotten and <laughs> was translated to English in the early '80s, and then became part uh, of uh, Chuck McKinley's work on a system back in '84, um, I think, or '86, and then and that also kind of then reinvigorated people's interest in. Uh, in uh, theory and how data visualization works kind of on a, on a higher level. And that led to a whole number of, of, of uh, things uh, down the line, including the grammar of graphics. So Wilkinson references uh, Bertin and builds upon uh, what Bertin did uh, there. But, but so, and, and I will I'll say one thing here, the semiology of graphics is important but I don't think anybody wants to read it unless you're really into like data vis nerdery and and it's a very difficult book to read. Uh, but it's it certainly had a huge impact on the field of data visualization. The grammar of graphics is uh, is a big tome. It's in a box right now. I can't show you the actual book. Sorry, but <laughs> but it's a tome. You have to be pretty serious if you want to read it. Uh, I, I don't recommend it, but it is a very well written book. It's it's a great book. It's really well thought through, and it's a, and Wilkinson was a great writer, so it's 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 great. But it's not. I would not recommend <laughs> reading it. Very briefly, I'll talk about the layers here. Um, this is a chart I've, or like a little illustration of this that I found uh, on a blog that I thought was pretty good. That so there are these like layers of of how you build charts using the grammar of graphics. And they will be different for any kind of system that that builds upon it. But at the bottom, there's the data. Then there are the basic mappings. These are called aesthetics in the grammar of graphics, which I find unfortunate, but that's what Wilkinson called them. Then there are geometries, which are the the kind of higher level uh, mappings to things like shapes and so on. And then you can take those and 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 embed them into things called facets, which are which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, in, in like five minutes when we get to the faceted scatter plot that I want to talk about. And then you can build things on top of that. So as I said, there is a lot of statistics built into the grammar of graphics. So you could do things like you have a data set, you want to compute the mean or the median or the standard deviation, and then you would show that. Like if you make a, a box plot, uh, you would just show that directly. But you could also just show that as a bar chart or if whatever you want, or a dot plot perhaps would be better for a mean so you can show a lot of data, a lot of derived values that you compute also on, on the data. You don't have to necessarily show every single data point. Um, and then, of course, there is all of the, the stuff around the chart that you need to understand what's going on. So there's a coordinate system, there are labels, there are legends, and so on. So all of this is the, the top parts of the coordinates and the theme. And the, there is a... Uh, a distinction here between the grammar of graphics and then grammars of graphics. So there are a lot of systems that are grammar-based, but that are not 
strictly following or really at all following uh, the grammar of graphics. Uh, the most faithful representation or implementation was Hadley Wickham's uh, PhD thesis, another very uh, interesting one to read if anybody wants. To, like essentially, if you want to know about the grammar of graphics and read something that's much shorter, <laughs> much more condensed, and actually implemented it because Wilkinson did not implement the, the, the grammar of graphics as a system, but Hedley Wickham built ggplot and ggplot2 for R. So if you've used R, you probably have seen ggplot2. And gg in ggplot is grammar of graphics. That's where the gg comes from. Um, but there are lots of others. And um, oh, yeah. And so grammars of graphics are, of course, uh, much more powerful than chart choosers because you get to build things that are much more complex. And you can build them yourself, and you, you get you, you can build more things than you could could by just picking a chart. So if you've ever looked at the list of charts you can build in Excel or in Google Slides or whatever Google um, Sheets and so on, and you didn't find the thing you wanted, well maybe you can you can build it uh, yourself if you have a grammar based approach. But yeah, so it's built from re reusable charts. I didn't actually I forgot that I put those points here, but I've already kind of set this right. So this is basically reusable parts that you can uh, compose to build. Uh, other things with. And so there are a number of, of grammar-based tools and libraries. So Tableau being one of them, there is this, this, there's this grammar called VisQL, which is somewhat parallel to the grammar of graphics. It was actually built around the same time. And depending on who you ask, it was influenced by the grammar of graphics or not. But what VisQL is, is, was after was to specify both the, the data representation, the chart, and the database query at the same time. And so that's another grammar-based approach that's not mirror at all how the grammar of graphics works in the book, but it has its own grammatical structure and it has its own um, building blocks that are focused very much on data querying and, data, and database style thinking about data. And then uh, there's the thing, systems like Vega and Vega Lite, which is which are very much grammar based. Uh, but I'm honestly not entirely clear what the differences are between it and the grammar of graphics. I think they're fairly close. And then of course there's observable plot, and you will see a bunch more of plot as we're uh, going through this. And and there are more. So this is not I'm not trying to make this a uh, a complete list by any means. But there are a number of these. And 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 again, observable plot does not strictly follow the grammar of graphics. It's, it's, it's a grammar, but it is, uh, it's very much its own thing. So the, 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 the importance of the book, the grammar of graphics, isn't so much that it's, it is the, the, the blueprint for how to build a system, but it's, it sort of opened up this idea of thinking in grammars. And so now you can just build in a, a grammar that isn't exactly the same, that is a different, different grammar, but it's still the, the idea of the grammar is incredibly useful. Uh, and lots of the building blocks are going to be shared between these systems. All right, limits of grammars, very briefly. There are, so grammars sound like a good idea, and they are. So I'm, I'm, I have a few limits here. I don't want to sound like I'm, <laughs> I'm saying that they're bad. I just want to make sure that we also cover this a little bit, because all the power they have, there are some limitations. So, uh, and, and so the limitation being, and I will talk about this more when you talk about things like tree maps, but even simple charts re actually require a lot more computation than you would think. Uh, so my example here is a pie chart uh, or a 100% stacked line, uh, uh, sorry, a stacked bar chart or a stacked area chart is the same thing, or things like density plots. There's a lot of things that look simple, but that require a whole bunch of compu computation and, that, and you can specify that from building blocks, you have to have that built in. And actually one of my criticisms of the grammar of graphics was always that tree maps are kind of tacked on as their own thing. You can't actually make tree maps in the grammar of graphics. Uh, yeah, especially, so next point here about being recursion. So when you have recursion, like in a tree map, or when you have an optimization system or, or, or part of your, of your chart type, then uh, like with squarified tree maps, you, you can't it just, you can't really specify it unless you, you specify the entire algorithm that does it. And it's just not doable in a, uh, in a grammar. So things like packed layouts, trees, uh, graphs, and so on. Uh, and then another thing, and this is going back to the comment earlier about brushing, it's difficult to capture interactivity or to, to, to build a grammar of interactivity. I know that there's been some work uh, well, I know that there's some work on that in, in plot, and there has been some work uh, in Vega Lite, I think, 
but it's it the, the, these the 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 often I think I think Vega actually essentially does a lot of the the interactivity by by having snippets of code in 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 the definition, and of course and this which is. I don't want to call it a cop out, but but it's not no longer strictly a grammar because now you have code in there, and of course code is great because code can do anything, but it's no longer a pure grammar, um, right? But there is of course a, a trade off between flexibility and expressiveness here. So if you want more uncommon and more bespoke charts, uh, you might have to go to something like D three, which is incredibly powerful, and it's not a grammar in any sense really. I mean, there of course it is composable, but I don't think anybody would call it a grammar. Uh, whereas if you want to have faster exploration and variations of common charts, so you can still do a lot in a grammar, of course, then the grammar is what you want. But if you're very bespoke, if you're trying to get to very unusual chart types, then um, then you, you're going to want to have something else. So, so the examples, some of the examples I showed you here, uh, like the Sankey diagram, it, it's just like, I have no idea how you would specify this in any kind of grammar, unless it's a Sankey grammar, <laughs> it's very specific. Or, uh, well, actually this one is easy, um, but, uh, and the tree map as well. So we'll, we'll and um, yeah, actually some of these are easier than others certainly, or this one is actually pretty easy too. So there are certainly a lot of things you can do in grammar. So again, I'm not trying to say that they're, that they're bad, but they have their limitations. Right. Um, oh yeah, so <laughs> it's funny because it's a, such to me this is such an obvious thing because I've I've known Hadley Wickham for a long time and I knew of his work for a long time. So so yeah, the the GG and GG plot is a gram of graphics. And then this question here about Tableau has Tableau published the VisQL definition? They have not, no. And it's actually it's a bit more of a complicated story uh, that. It's there is a paper. There are there are two papers that are sort of foundational about the system called um, Pulse, Polestar, I think. <laughs> now I'm getting confused because there are so many systems that that, that are puns that that, that that have names that are puns on Polaris. Sorry, Polaris is what it's called. So the Polaris system <laughs> was the basis for Tableau. Uh, but there are now all these systems that are sort of puns on that name, like Polestar and all these things. So it's getting hard to remember which one the original actually is. So there are a couple of papers on that that talk about how, what this looks like, what especially the querying looks like. But there is no complete specification of VisQL. And not to get too much into the details here, but I think there there is no no strict implementation of the actual grammar in the system even. But it is certainly based on the thinking behind it. So, okay, since I'm kind of running behind here anyway, I'm going to skip the, the example at the end. I'm going to do that next time, but I'll spend a few more minutes on this here now. So the, so the, the thing about grammars that I was trying to talk about earlier about grammar, the grammar of graphics being important, not just be, not, not because it's, it's the exact thing that everybody does, but the thinking behind it, the same thing is true for grammars. So if you think about a grammar and you and you sort of sketch that grammar out <clears throat> and then your system is based on it doesn't mean you actually implement the grammar necessarily you could but you don't have to you can just use that grammar approach to build the building blocks and then have that guide the design pro um, process of that uh, of that system so you don't need to need to do to do actually the follow to do the default the, the total like grammar implementation within your system and it but it still helps you build a better system a more a more modular system so i wanted to show you this very briefly here in <clears throat> in observable because of course that is why we are here um so let me see if i can actually find my Examples here, so I'll I'll kind of start with this today, and then I will finish this example next time because I I was uh, I thought I had more time for this, but I'll I'll just briefly show you. Let me see what I'm gonna show you. Let actually let's let's just do this part here, and then maybe we'll do the rest, and then then I'll do a recap next time and show you um, the example uh, that I wanted to show you. So here I have a. A scatter plot, and a scatter plot is a nice example because it is the. Sorry about that. I need to rearrange a few things here so I can see what I'm doing. Okay, you can see what I'm doing there. 
So this is a, here's how you specify a scatter plot in a plot, in observable plot. And I'll probably, I should probably do something here real quick. Penguins, I've already used that. So I'll just do this. So we have a data set here called penguins, which you saw briefly earlier in this scatter plot matrix. And this contains, I'll actually, no, let's make a table. Uh, I'll close this, make a table. So what this contains is a, uh, a number of, of, of values here. So we have the species uh, of penguins. There are three different ones. I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Adeli, Adeli, I don't know. Chentu and Chinstrap. And then there are three different islands that they live on in the Antarctic. And then the, there are a number of numerical values here. So th th these are these body measurements that you saw earlier. So we have the, oh, actually I have an, ex I have a, an illustration. So this is uh, my colleague, <laughs> Alison Horst did this, uh, that is a, an illustration of, well, what, what does this even mean, right? What's a common? Uh, so the common is basically the beak of, of, a, um, of a penguin. I, not exactly a penguin expert, but so we're looking at two measurements here, the length and the depth of, of the common. And so this is what you see here, common length, common depth, the flipper length, and the body mass. And then we also have the sex here. I think that's, that's it, yeah. And so what I can do here now in this chart definition in plot is that I define, oh yeah, and I forgot to say this. So I'm, I'm defining marks. And so the term marks comes from, um, from Jacques Bertin's uh, semiology of graphics. And, uh, and in, in, in this array of marks, I can now specify what I'm gonna show. And it could have any number. So this is where we're getting to composability. I could build a chart that has a whole bunch of different things and we'll get to that later. But in this case, we're, we're using the dot mark. And in plot, these are function calls. But you can read this, you can basically ignore that this is a function call at all. You can basically look at this as simply a de declaration here. So you could, you could think of this as just being essentially saying, pick the dot mark. And then here we're giving it the data set, which is called penguins. And then it has to have a number of mappings. And so these mappings are what Wilkinson would call aesthetics. I will not call them aesthetics ever again because I don't think that's a good term, but uh, they are mappings of data to, uh, of data dimensions, of data columns to the visual um, things that you can see on the screen. So in this case, we have the common length here on the x-axis. So you see that this, this is the common length here, and then the depth is on the vertical axis. And so we have these two values here mapped to these two dimensions. And this is a very straightforward mapping, and we'll get to more uh, later when we, when, when we talk about categorical axis and so on, what this actually means in terms of the, uh, the grammar, sort of treatment and the scales. But also I can, of course, add things here. So I can say, well, let's add a fill and use the species for that. I think it's called species, right? So now I get different colors for these different, um, what is different? penguins and for some reason I was expecting there to be a um, to, to be a, a legend but for some reason there's no color legend that pops up but um, but we'll just ignore it for the, for the moment so these are uh, and actually let me add a can I do this real quick then we can at least mouse over. Okay, so now we can see which one is which by just mousing over. So we have the the red here are Chen Tu, orange are Chin Strap, and blue are the Adeli. Adeli. Uh, and so, but but you can see that I can just add things by by specifying things here that are just being mapped. And this is extremely simple because all I'm doing here is adding things that are being mapped. I could also map something to size, for example. Actually, let's try this to just just to show this real quick. So I'm going to add the radius. Um, and use the, I think it's called body mass in grams. Is that right? No. Oh, I need a comma. All right. This is the, uh, the little trick here is that, that you have to keep this a, a correct and valid JavaScript statement. So I needed the comma here, but so now there are small, the, the, the you can see that, that these guys here are bigger. They have a bigger body mass. 
than these because the dots are a little bit smaller here uh, than here. So we can see, we can add more things, we can map more things uh, as we as we go. And then and next time we'll talk about how to make this chart a bit more interesting into, into a faceted chart and why that is something that is, works specifically well for um, in, in a grammar-based system like plot. So with that, uh, I'm... I apologize for running a little bit over, but uh, this is this is the first part of this, and I appreciate you all sticking around, and I will uh, talk to you again on Thursday.